Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on this, the 153rd anniversary of the nation's first official Memorial Day. Back then it was called Decoration Day because good civilians after the Civil War would groom the battlefields, groom the cemeteries, and plant fresh cut flowers at the graves of the fallen. In his best-selling book, War and Remembrance, the acclaimed author Herman Wouk offered that the beginning of the end of war lies in remembrance. To that end, today, let us remember and let that ending begin. The daytime group is 0700 hours, 1 April 1945. It was Easter Sunday. In Europe, the war which began in 1939 was coming to an end. The Russians were closing in from the east and from the west, the Americans, the British, and the Canadians. U.S. ships, men, and materiel were already being diverted to staging areas in the Pacific for Operation Olympic, the planned invasion of the Japanese homeland. <laughs> Casualty forecasts were frightful. But on that Easter Sunday, 1 April, the focus is on the enemy bastion on the island of Okinawa, some 300 miles south of Japan proper. By day's end, 70,000 combat troops, Army and Marine, would have gone ashore. And the battle which began there on 1 April would rage for 82 days through April, May, and deep into June. On the American side, some 8,000 soldiers and Marines would make the ultimate sacrifice. Tens of thousands more would be wounded. And offshore, scores of U.S. ships would be damaged or sunk, and some 5,000 sailors would perish as well at the hands of swarms of kamikazes, suicide pilots intent on crashing their bomb-laden aircraft into our ships. Enemy losses are higher still, driven by both desperately stubborn defense and by the conviction enforced by their own military and civilian leaders that in the face of defeat, suicide was honorable, surrender was not. And so today on Memorial Day, no matter the hardships and travails which beset us in the here and now, across America, we pause and remember. Ladies and gentlemen, I would ask now Father Mendoza, pastor of Most Holy Trinity Church, to deliver today's invocation. Padre. Heavenly Father, on this Memorial Day, we pray for those who courageously lay down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the examples of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless the families of our fallen troops and fill their homes and their lives with your strength and peace. In union with people of goodwill of every nation, embolden us to answer the call to work for peace and justice, and thus seek an end to violence and conflict around the globe. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Padre. And again, thank you once again for the hospitality last night. Greatly appreciated. And now I'll ask Ms. Lisa Zolkowitz eyes to step to the podium and lead us in the national anthem. Commander. All right.
Thank you. Miss Lee says awkward times. Stand up. He. Across America, in houses of worship, school auditoriums, village greens, and along a few main streets everywhere, Americas are coming together. Those we honor today fought and they fell in steamy tropical jungles, on frozen ridgelines and ravines, on trackless oceans, and shifting desert sands. And after fully a century of military aviation, like our very own Major Raul Luffberry, they fought and they fell too from the skies above, all of the above. And so today, we remember. The daytime group is 24 October 1921, some three years after the end of World War I. The location, Hotel de Ville, or City Hall if you wish, in Chalon, France. The American soldier's name is Sergeant Edward F. Younger, a highly decorated veter veteran of the American Expeditionary Force. But he no longer resembles the enthusiastic, inexperienced young man he had been just a few short years ago when he enlisted in 1917. Rather, he bears the visible scars of battle as well as the many invisible scars seared into his mind. But nothing had quite prepared him for this moment, this singular, most extraordinary assignment in October of 1921, three years after the end of World War I. Light filtering through small panes of glass in the town hall illuminated four identical caskets, each draped in an American flag. There were no distinguishing markings, no identifying placards, just four caskets, four flags. Sergeant Younger's mind raced as he slowly, almost reverently, circled the four coffins, first in one direction and then back again. His assignment this day was to select one of them to be America's unknown soldier of World War I. Finally, after what must have seemed both to him and to the assembled dignitaries like an eternity, he placed a spray of roses atop one of the, co one of the coffins he stepped back and rendered a salute. This day's mission accomplished. On, no, on 10 November, back in the United States Capitol, Sergeant Younger, together with other distinguished pallbearers, including Medal of Honor recipients Army Sergeant Samuel Whitfield and Marine Gunnery Sergeant Ernest Jensen, would carry the coffin into the Capitol Rotunda, where it would lay in state overnight until the morning of 11 November and the soldier's final journey to Arlington National Cemetery and his resting place, the tomb of the unknown soldier, where he remains to this day. The tomb of the unknown soldier ranks among the most revered and frequented visitor attractions in all of the greater capital area, dedicated to the memory of all those Americans who lost not only their lives, but their very identity in the service of our country. The inscription there, carved in white marble, reads, Here lies in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. Today, entombed therein are the remains of three American servicemen, the second from World War II, the third from the Korean War. Thanks to the wonders of modern science, the remains of a fourth veteran from the Vietnam War were identified and removed in 1998 and buried in accordance with the family's wishes. It bears repeating, the nation does not know the identity of those Americans entombed there. At a time when so many among us are caught up in that pursuit of a few minutes of fame on Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok, the prospect that one's identity might forever be lost should be sufficiently powerful as to command our attention, our reflection, and our respect. Joining us today on the steps, to your left, Major William W. Dickinson, Jr., Police Chief William Wright, as I was. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you again, sir.
Our acting fire chief. Where's Mr. Sentinel? Thank you, sir. Welcome aboard. Our memorial parade marshal, Mr. Roy Ken. Our guest speaker, Mr. Dennis Mannion. Reverend Andres Mendoza Floyd, Pastor of Most Holy Trinity Church, Ms. Lisa Zokowitz Ives. Sitting below, if you will, Mrs. Ruth Palmer, Chairwoman of the Veterans Memorial Committee, and our Gold Star sister, Lieutenant Colonel Rosemary DeAngelis, United States Army, retired. Yes, thank you. I've asked Mayor Dickinson to step to the microphone and read Sergeant Cannon's biography, given his life of service to his country and his community, worthy. Thank you, Major Messier. Mr. Roy Cannon, a native and lifelong resident of Wallingford, Roy graduated from Lyman Hall High School in 1948 and promptly enlisted in the U.S. Marines. Upon graduation from boot camp, Paris Island, South Carolina, Private Cannon underwent specialty training in California as an ammunition technician before departing for the South Korea in August 1950. A member of the 1st Marine Brigade and later the 1st Marine Division, he participated in actions along the Pusan perimeter, Inchon landings, and subsequent capture of Seoul and the Hungnam Chosun Reservoir campaign. In 1951, now back in the United States, he married his lifelong partner, Margaret, which he describes as, quote, the best thing I ever did, unquote, and served in both Virginia and California before being discharged in August 1952. Back in Wallingford, he worked as a carpenter, foreman, project superintendent, and then project manager at F.C. Wooding until he retired. Emblematic of his personal commitment to community service, Roy has been actively involved in veterans' activities and the Wallingford Veterans Committee throughout his lifetime. He is a life member of the American Legion, having served in a variety of billets and capacities, including commander of Shaw Sinan Post 73 of the American Legion. And he has been deeply involved with the Boy Scouts as Troop 5 leader and Eagle Scout project mentor and supporter for 60 years. Roy has one son, two grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. In recognition, of his lifetime of service to his country and community, Roy was unanimously selected to receive this award. Thank everyone who was involved with this very much. It is an honor, and I accept this with all humility. I thank you, everyone, that had anything to do with it. Now, our guest speaker, a native of Connecticut, graduated from Notre Dame High School in West Haven, Connecticut, studied at the University of Notre Dame for two years, and then decided to join the Marines in 1967. After his welcome aboard at boot camp Paris Island and advanced infantry training, he attended Naval Gunfire School in Coronado, California, and departed for Vietnam in September 1967, where he was assigned as an artillery forward observer with Kilo Company, 3rd Battalion, 26 Marines. He was the only enlisted forward observer in the unit, a billet typically reserved to an officer. 
Along with other units, he was assigned to the remote Quezon combat base in response to increased enemy activity in the area. Kilo Company's specific assignment was Hill 861, where Corporal Mannion was solely responsible for the artillery support available to defend Hill 861, a vital outpost overlooking the main combat base. In January 1968, Tet, Quezon was attacked by an estimated 40,000 NVA. During the 77-day siege of Quezon that followed, Corporal Mannion conducted over 300 fire missions that helped to thwart the enemy NVA attempt to overrun the hill, the base, and its 6,000 Marine defenders. Twice wounded, he was awarded two Purple Hearts and the Combat Infantry Ribbon. He and other members of a unit were also awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Mustering out in December 1969, he resumed his college studies, this time at UConn in the fall of 1970, graduating in 1973 with a degree in English and education. He taught at Lyman, excuse me, at Sheehan High School for 30 years. My apologies, Dennis. <laughs> in 1990, he became Sheehan's head coach, head football coach, and held the post for almost 12 years and received numerous awards, among them the Distinguished American Award from the New Haven chapter of the National Football Foundation Hall of Fame. Dennis is a lifetime member of the National Organization of the Purple Heart, Disabled American Veterans, and the Quezon Veterans Association. His experiences have been documented on the History Channel, CBS TV, and the ABC Millennium Series, as well as in three books and one video documentary. He and his wife Joan, also retired Sheehan High School educator, are proud parents of four children. They have seven grandchildren that reside in Cheshire. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Manion. It's a lot of pages, but it's large font and double space. So <laughs> not the word. Thank you for the kind introduction. I hope I can live up to it. There is an emotional and territorial tug, at least for me, when it comes to speaking about the meaning and significance of Memorial Day. In many ways, it's too close to the heart. When the wall in DC was dedicated in 1982, I went, because until then, I was just carrying around 28 names scribbled on a faded piece of paper that I kept in the glove box of my car. I made a promise that I, that I do my best to get back to visit the wall at least every five years, and I've been faithful to that. There are 28 names I go to personally visit, almost always at dawn, and I only have to pause in front of one, close my eyes, and the decades seem to melt away. However, the individual I always seek out first has his name inscribed on a panel that preceded my arrival in Vietnam by six weeks. His name is as signif significant to me as the other 27, but for a totally different reason. That being said, I think I can give you a sense and purpose for Memorial Day if you allow me to relate a story that involves three people, covers a span of 13 years, and by necessity will have to double back from time to time upon itself. I spent the, sum, the months of July and August in 1967 hiking and patrolling the hot, dusty hills of Camp Pendleton, a sprawling marine base situated halfway between LA and San Diego. I was with an infantry battalion in final stages of preparation for deployment to Vietnam in September. It was a scorching, intense, somewhat bewildering eight weeks with countless training hours, demanding instructors, wild rumor. Ring Corps is famous for that, as well as other branches of the service, and unsettling speculation. The only respite from all that was that, believe it or not, it was a Monday to Friday work schedule, and we had every weekend free. We were getting paid, of course, and I had the money. So every Friday when work secured, I took a cab to San Diego Airport, and I flew the 355 miles to Phoenix, Arizona. I never missed a weekend. As hot as California was, Phoenix was even worse in terms of summer heat. But because my roommate at Notre Dame in South Bend for two years lived in Phoenix, the weather was inconsequential. My weekends with Ralph Blake and his large family were magical because they got me away from the iron hands of the Marines. But it was bittersweet 
because every weekend brought me another week closer to a plane flight across the Pacific Ocean. Ralph, who still is one of my best friends, was caught up with the emotions of spending the summer before his senior year of college with a friend who also should have been returning to campus as well. Instead, George said I, I two years of Notre Dame and then joined the Marine Corps, but here's how it worked. I should have been returning that year. Instead, squandered opportunities, too many social adventures, and fate had Ralph and I on a narrow path that was soon to split. He back to South Bend for his final year and me to the rice paddies and jungles. Despite all the marine training and the constant references to death that war could bring about, I was still unsure but feeling bulletproof at the same time. I felt that no matter what happened over there, death would not happen to me, and I think every member of the service who ever goes to combat feels the same way. That all changed one of, on one of my last weekends in Phoenix. I came out of the arrivals terminal and saw Ralph's car in its usual spot by the curb. However, he wasn't in it. Two of his sisters were. And when I got in, they explained that Ralph was at a funeral service for one of his high school teammates and classmates who had been killed in Vietnam 10 days earlier. He too had been a Marine. He had hiked those same Pendleton Hills as me. He listened to the same classes and lectures. And I have no doubt that he flew home to Phoenix every weekend too. What made the information so tough for me that he was killed on a combat patrol two weeks before he was due to rotate out of Vietnam with his 13 month tour completed. Even now, all these decades later, the events surrounding that weekend stand out with crystal clarity. Michael J. Hiller from Phoenix was the first person I knew who died in Vietnam and yet I had never met him. There was never even a handshake between us. The thought that kept hammering at me all that weekend and into my first weeks in Vietnam was that if death in combat could happen to someone I knew, then it was apparent that it could happen to me as well. Somehow, and I am not sure how, and with all sorts of luck, I got through 13 months over there and came home to the States with two dozen other Marines and corpsmen to remember and to grieve. But it's Mike and Ralph that I wish to conclude my remarks with today. In June of 1980, not too many years ago, that's a joke, I made arrangements with Ralph to meet him in California for a long getaway. I was making the longer trip, but that was easy enough because school had just let loose for the summer and Ralph only had to miss a few days from his new law practice. We settled on San Diego because one of his sisters lived there and that gave us a place to stay for nothing. We didn't plan a lot. The beach a few times, racquetball, a Padres baseball game, sleeping late and eating well. I think the best parts of the trip were the quiet times, reminiscing, trading insults and projecting what the next decade would be like at our jobs and our families. One night we headed out on the freeway to a large movie complex north of the city and the conversation turned to his two young sons. We were talking about names and the sometimes maddening process with which parents go through when it comes to rejecting or considering names for a new one. Ralph said that part, that part was simple for him. There was never a doubt in his mind that his firstborn son would be Michael. There was a momentary silence between us and as our memories began to churn and shift, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. There was a momentary silence between us as our memories began to churn and shift. I know it was a few miles before one of us, and I really don't remember who, broke the silence first. But soon we were reliving that terribly sad weekend in Phoenix 13 years before. I spoke about my fear and how the death of someone I had, I had heard high school stories about but had never met had stayed with me long after I was out of the Marines. Ralph spoke about how everyone in their circle of friends, family too, were surprised when Michael enlisted after, after only a year of community college. They were not, however, surprised all, and not surprised at all that he was determined to do well while he was in the service. Ralph went on to describe how crusty he was to learn of his friend's death. I'm paraphrasing a bit here, but the gist of it was this. When, the, when, the, when, the, when Ralph's home phone rang, his mother picked up. A few seconds later, she called him to the kitchen and handed him the phone and said, it's Mr. Hiller. Hello, Mr. Hiller, how are you? Have you heard any news about Mike? Yes, I do, he replied, but it's not the news any of us want to hear. The Marines informed me just over an hour ago that Mike had been killed while on a combat patrol yesterday, two weeks before he was coming home for good. It'll probably be a week before we get him home and we want you to be one of the pallbearers. As he was relaying all this to me in the car, 
I sat quietly thinking how easily it could have been my own father making this phone call from New Haven out to Phoenix. Ralph stopped talking. I glanced to my left. There was no more story to be told. It was the first time I had ever genuinely seen my buddy cry other than tears of laughter. There we were, two guys in our mid-thirties on the way to the movies blinking back tears for the loss of someone 13 years before. I can't say that our evening out was spoiled. We saw the film and went out to eat. But I could not help but think about my killer that evening and into the next day. See, I couldn't shake loose from my personal thoughts about war and in particular combat. As close as those two friends were, my killer and I had a bond between us that only those in uniform and in harm's way could speak of or relate to. Death is with us all. I know that. I don't deny it. But there are few things one does in life with death as a possible outcome. Serving in uniform means individuals risk forfeiting movies, dinner, baseball games, and all the rest forever. Worst of all, they risk forfeiting family and friendships. And I know what a good friend Ralph must have been with my killer because he's been that kind of a good friend with me for 57 years. What I'm trying to say is that my killer's loss is our loss, yours and mine. And that's what Memorial Day is all about. It affords us the chance to honor, and in some cases communicate, with those who have forfeited everything that we have as a nation and a people. There are millions of my killers out there from our country's past and present who we honor on this day. But I think that often the sheer number of dead are so enormous that unless we know someone specific, it can be difficult to grasp the concept, at least in the abstract. I've introduced my killer to you this morning. And when you leave this event today, say hi to him for me. I know it would make him smile. He doesn't need tears or thanks, nor do his comrades. Simple reflection and recognition are all it takes. And your presence here this morning represents that. May, God, may the Lord bless all of you and this great country of ours. Thank you very much. three sons and a daughter, we do, and my middle son is Dennis Blake Mannion, and they call him Blake all the time because of Ralph Blake and our friendship for all these years. Thank you. You may have noticed the Gold Star banner overhead. A little background. When an individual joins the service, the family is eligible and entitled to receive a Blue Star banner. The Blue Star denotes the individual on active duty in the United States military. If there are two family members, that banner has two Blue Stars. And by the way, this is an oversized edition. The, blue, the banners are in fact about the copy paper size. If tragedy strikes, and that service member is lost in action in wartime, the family is eligible to receive a Gold Star banner, the, gold, the Blue Star having been replaced by a Gold Star. The most memorable one that I'm aware of is the Sullivan family in World War II. Five brothers insisted when they chose to enlist in the Navy that they would serve together or they wouldn't join the Navy at all. They got their wish, they served together, and they all perished on the same night in November 1942 when their ship was sunk in a nighttime naval battle in the South Pacific. So the Sullivan family received a five gold star banner. For gold star families, observances this day are best bittersweet. They cannot console parents and siblings who have suffered the loss of a family member at war. And they cannot console the widow who sits down to meals she'll not enjoy, faced as she is with an empty chair across from her own.
nor can they ease the sorrow and the anguish of the children whose parent has gone away. Never to witness their recitals and graduations, their trials and their triumphs. Against such losses as these, the gratitude of a nation affords little solace. It is wholly incapable of balancing the loss of companionship, the utter disruption and devastation of lives and lifestyles occasioned by that sacrifice. And so when, observ when observances such as this are concluded, bereaved families may linger at grave sites marking their loved one's final resting place. They'll know unfathomable sorrow, unspeakable rage, a twinge of self-pity, and then they'll feel bad about that. Gazing forlornly, forlornly at cold granite stones, they'll trace the engraved names with their fingers, pound the grass with their fist, shed a deluge of tears, and wonder what but for the very hard work of freedom might have been. And so on this day, we pause in communion with these families and reflect on how great the price of our freedoms has been. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us today Lieutenant Colonel Rosemary DeAngelis, United States Army, retired. She's a Gold Star sister. She lost her brother in Vietnam. And she will place a wreath here at the foot of the steps, and we will relo relocate it after the ceremony. Colonel. To the north of us, the police department rifle squad will deliver volleys. Don't be alarmed. Freeze it! Fire! Christopher Zolkowitz will perform taps. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, squad. To the south of the parade ground, Mr. David Gady, all of your fire department, will pipe Amazing Grace.
Thank you, David. Now I'll ask Miss Lisa Zokowitz's eyes once again to return to the microphone. Join her. And yes, please join me now in singing God Bless America. God bless America. season for flowers. Decoration Day, and that's why it's the end of May, because there would be fresh cut flowers in great supply to decorate the graves. Now, Reverend Mendoza will deliver the benediction. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the blessings and the grace that you've bestowed upon us this morning, be able to be here to remember. Many men and women sacrifice their lives for our freedom, for our families, for the very grace that you've given us this morning to gather as a community. We entrust the many men and women that continue to serve our nation. May you protect them, and strengthen them with your love. May you continue to bless their families and all those who continue to sacrifice for our nation, make the ultimate sacrifice, giving their lives for our nation. We entrust this day to your hands. We ask you to bless our nation and each and every one of us that have gathered this morning throughout our nation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Padre. Seats. Those we honor today can never know if their sacrifice really mattered. Only we can know the answer to that. Only we have it within our power to influence the future and make sure that their sacrifice was truly worthwhile. In the closing moments of the acclaimed movie, Saving Private Ryan, one of the central characters, now mortally wounded, tells Private Ryan the soldier rescued from the horror and the maelstrom of war, that he has to earn this, this being safe passage back home to his family, his friends, his community, and indeed to life itself. Earn this, you have to earn this, the dying soldier counsels. Ladies and gentlemen, the same holds true for all of us. For in a very real sense, whether we wore a uniform or not, all of us here today our private Ryans, a very dear price, the very highest price imaginable, has been paid in our name and on our behalf. It falls to us, the living, to ensure that their noble sacrifice was not in vain. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony today. Thanks to the mayor, the town council, all of the departments, police department, fire department, public works, 
Veterans Memorial Committee, Celebrations Committee, and so many others. Thank you to all the posts for your participation. I would be remiss if I didn't notice that way off in the distance on street patrol today is Superintendent Menzo. Thank you for your service, sir, and thank you for your support of veterans over the many years. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Have a good day. Dismissed!